And we think this makes a lot of sense, but then you expose it to some, some logic here and you realize it doesn't make sense. As soon as you think about time in that way, you actually are just thinking about space. Hey, what up people? Welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California who studied philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast where we could bullshit with impunity. I am Austin Hayden-Smith. And I am Troy Polidori. And this week, it's going to be interesting, guys. We got something fun in store for you. We're going to talk about... I I think so. (laughs) I think so. Uh, We're going to talk about time. Is time real? What is time, motherfuckers? And, I mean, Troy, how how are we going to frame this discussion later? Well, I mean, we, we thought about maybe doing it in that classic uh, freshman in, in college. I just smoked uh, a lot of weed. And so I'm going to start thinking about whether or not time is real from <laughs> just from that proposition by itself and then extrapolate. But we thought better of it. I instead decided that we're going to go over J.M. Taggart's paradox of time or his argument that time is unreal. And uh, we'll present that and then we'll talk about whether we buy it or what our thoughts are on it. It's a little bit more structured than you normally would. Yeah, and I think that there are some profound political implications that we can draw from this too. So maybe we can tease some of that. Of course you do. Out. Of course I do. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> All right, so for our first segment, we have to do the shitty minutes. This is where one of us rants about whatever it is that's grinding our gears this week. So Austin, what's your shitty minute? So I've been thinking a little bit about this. I actually tweeted about it, but I've been thinking about my frustration with adulthood. And it basically, in the sense that not like my own adulthood or I don't like getting older. I'm actually like when people complain about getting older or like, oh, I'm old. I can't do what I used to do anymore. I'm like, stop complaining, motherfuckers. Like it's just part of life. You know, we all die. I kind of like getting older. I'm not talking about that part of adulthood. I don't mind that shit. I, I'm enjoying this, actually. And ask me again when I'm in my 50s and I can't fucking move because I've got arthritis in my knees. But still, in my in my mid-30s, I'm cool, you know? But what I mean more is that I thought when I was younger that adulthood was this place where people had clearly settled ideas, they had thoughts, they had reasoned and rational explanation for their ideas, and they didn't partake in the same childhood bullshit and drama that was just so common in high school or junior high or elementary school. But as I have gone into adulthood, and I think it's safe to say that I'm firmly in adulthood now, right? Like this is this is firmly adulthood. Once you're in your 30s, you're 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 you are an adult now. Like there's no more fucking around. You're an adult, right? I think I was wrong, man. I think adults are idiots, and I think that 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 image that I had of adults being mature was total bullshit. Now, I don't know if this is a sign of our times. I don't know if this is a byproduct of the drama of social media. I don't know if this is the influence of reality television that is life imitating art. I don't know exactly what it is. I don't know if it's always been this way, but I do know that my image of what I thought adulthood was and what I thought adults were is was total bullshit, man. And the way that I tweeted it out is, you know that na 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 tone that you used to do as a kid? Yeah. I just constantly see that from people who are like in their 50s on Twitter, on the news, who have PhDs, who are scientists, who are politicians, <laughs> who are business owners, who are thought leaders, and it really is fucking annoying, man. Dude, Austin, are you etiquette policing here? Uh, is this etiquette policing? Is that what I'm doing? Is that? I don't know. Is this etiquette? Like, I'm, am I saying that there's supposed to be an adult etiquette and these people aren't, like, characterizing or they're not embodying the adult etiquette? Yeah, that's kind of how I'm interpreting it. Is that incorrect? Uh, if it is, then there's one truth that I found with regards to etiquette. There's one absolute <laughs> standard. It's don't use the na-na-na-na-na tone. Be a fucking adult, you fucking babies. Jesus. Yeah, so is this more of like a like a condemnation, like a moral judgment of that, or just a, holy shit, I can't believe this is the case, or it's just well, so it, distinct it, from my previous impression? 
it's both, but I think one is connected to the other. But it's more it's more descriptive, but then I think it's moving into the normative, which is Jesus guys, get your shit together. Stop. Like just stop being so childish. It's the you know the the meme that's like name a better this, I'll wait or show me the proof, I'll wait. Oh yeah. I, My God. Even as I'm saying it, I can't help but like move my body and contort it like a snake like mm -hmm. <laughs> what where is it doo, doo, doo. like that's the tone that i hear just constantly like oh well then i guess we're doing that now or oh well what about the obama years or oh well this must be the case i'm like you guys aren't you fucking adults i just did not think that adults ever spoke that way now maybe this is because when i was a kid i was around adults who didn't speak that speak that way and my mom was very much like whenever she saw anything like that it was like oh god adults don't speak that way you know she would she would like she talked about how in the business world like oh my god i cannot be around that so i thought that was the minority that she was criticizing because they were clearly just immature but that everybody else in the real adult world was mature but i've yet to find that world that my mom made me think really existed and so maybe I just am – I need to go into like the business world where she existed and that's where the real adults are. I don't know. I know that they're not on Twitter. That's what I do. Yeah, it might just be that social media self-selects all those same people that you saw earlier. <laughs> maybe. Your mom said we're immature, right? That's, yeah. I think that's actually pretty plausible as an explanation. But then they're on the media too. I, I see them – Yeah. these are people who are writers for – WAPO and for New York Times and their MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, the, they're all the adults, man. All the adults that I am surrounded with, and they're all doing that shit. Yeah, dude. One of my one of my favorite things to kind of uh, satirize or or make fun of is that there's strains on both the left and the right that complain about po uh, political correctness and stuff. And you know, and sometimes those critiques I think are pretty good actually. And there's certainly problems with the ideas of political correctness. But one of the assumptions. Is that if we just this happens on both the right and the left? One of these assumptions is that if you just sort of release the constraints of political correctness, like free speech will dominate and it will be like beautiful free expression and free love and like sixties hippie stuff. And then when you do that, it, everyone just acts like children. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, this is democracy, it's like, it's, right? <laughs> it's like yeah, it's the exact stereotype of like hippies are like, oh, it's it's free love, but it ends up with everyone walks home with chlamydia, right? Um, yeah. So. It's just funny that, that that tends to happen a lot, right? So are you saying that adulthood in the age of Twitter is thought chlamydia and speech chlamydia? <laughs> um, that sounds appropriately gross. So yeah, I'll go with that. Okay. Well, that works. Yeah, that's my shitty minute, man. I just, I just, it's fucking ridiculous and it's very common. It's, it, it's the, and it's mimetic too, you know, and, and, and listen, I am engaged in a cycle of mimesis. I copy certain memes and there are certain things that you partake in so i'm obviously not immune to it but it's more of the and, and i and i'm sure that i've been childish and stupid many times in my life so i'm not trying to s say this from some sort of position of purity it's more just m maybe i'm trying to make sure that i don't emulate that behavior and if i see it in myself i want people to make sure they email me or at me or smack me in the face at the bar and say Motherfucker, you're engaging in thought chlamydia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a like chlamydia. It also infects, right? In the mimetic sense. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, and it's it's easy to clear up. You just take a thought or speech <laughs> antibiotic and you're clear. We just got to figure out what those antibiotics are, man. <laughs> and then you have to send letters to all the people that you've had sex with. <laughs> <laughs> Did you or ever that watch you, that you've series? spoken about ideas with? Yeah, that's what I'm referencing. <laughs> I <laughs> thought sick. so. I thought so. Love, yeah. Wait, is that what it called? Love? Love sick. Love sick. Love sick. Love sick. Yeah. yeah, it's a show on Netflix, everybody. You should watch it. It's hilarious. All right, man. Let's get into this main segment, huh? Yeah. So, we are going to talk about this article by McTaggart called the unreality of time and you tell people a little bit about this because I've, I've read some really funny biographical stuff about him in preparing for this episode actually apparently he was a weird dude yeah i'm pretty sure all early analytic philosophers were weird ass dudes 
I don't I don't think I know anything biographically about Metagart except for two things. Okay. One one of his middle names is Metagart, I think. Well, okay, so, like he, so this is what so he was born with a different last name. Yeah, his middle name is McTaggart. He was born with a different last name, but because a family member died but didn't have a will or ha- had could only leave like the will to a McTaggart, he took on that person's last name. So his middle name is McTaggart and his last name is McTaggart. His second oh, last name. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> he has two last names. So what is it? It's John what? What's his name? John McTaggart something McTaggart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's pretty great. <laughs> uh, On the only other thing I know about him is that he uh, had something like he turned, he helped turn in Bertrand Russell for sedition. I've heard this World War One, something like that. He's one of the douchebags. So what's the deal? Because so Russell was a conscientious objector to the war. Yeah, yeah, and which, which was fine, but I guess he at some point verged on sedition by speaking out against the war. Okay, and, well I think uh, Metagger yeah. and somebody else, I think some of the people all turned him in. That's fucked up, man. Yeah, I know, so this right? is like this is like G. E. Moore and Russell and McTaggart and Broad, or Broad or however the fuck you say his name. Yeah, all at Cambridge, Oxford. Okay. okay, is it was Wittgenstein there? or Is he a little bit later? I think that's later. That's that's like like uh, and like Ra- like Ramsey and Wittgenstein. That's like the next generation, right? Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. So there's actually this this poem that was written about McTaggart. And um, I'm trying to find it real quick here. It's let me let me just get it. I found this on the philosophy. What is it? The 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 Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there are a couple of anecdotes. One is Bertrand Russell saying about how shy McTaggart was, and there's this poem that was written by F. H. Bradley. And the poem goes like this. Philosopher, your head is all askew. Apparently he walked with like his head all down and kind of all weird and like shy and kind of like brought in. So people were kind of like, oh, there goes shy McTaggart. So this that'll make sense with this. Philosopher, your head is all askew. Your gait is not majestic in the least. You ride three wheels where other men ride two. Philosopher, you are a funny beast. And... The reference to riding three wheels is because he rode a tricycle. <laughs> and I guess McTaggart loved this poem <laughs> about him. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is not going to help dispel the rumor that philosophers are fucking weirdos. No, not at all. So, okay, so he's known for one thing, right? He has an entire career of books. He wrote a lot on Hegel. And did some metaphysics, but he's really known for one article that's called The Unreality of Time that was published in Mind. And then he reworked it and put it into his big text that's called Nature of Existence. But really, it's this one argument that he makes that he's known for, right? Yeah. I mean, he was one of the British idealists that kind of followed Hegel and like like Bradley was. They were kind of dominant in uh, Britain uh, during that time pre-World War I. Um, and then when... Russell and company kind of discover Frege, who's the the Austrian German, I think, logician and philosopher, and they decide that that's the avenue philosophy should go down towards logic and language, and so analytic philosophy gets birthed from that, and the whole influence of Hegel and German philosophy on uh, British philosophy just kind of dies. Oh, so he's kind of a, a a last of a generation kind of figure. Yeah, very much so. Interesting. Now, what's the difference between the British idealists and like German idealists or when when people tend to think of idealism or when people tend to think of Hegel, there's a there's like a big break with the British interpretation of Hegel with some of like the German interpretations of Hegel, maybe influenced by Marx and his reading of Hegel. What what characterizes like the British idealists? Yeah, I mean, I don't know the specifics. I don't think I've read anything other than maybe like a little bit of Bradley and then some of Metagrit that had nothing to do with Hegel. But um, from what I gather, the, the German response to Hegel had the right Hegelians and the left Hegelians, right? Which we all know, left Hegelians were like Marx and those who wanted to kind of flip um, Hegel on his head a bit and wanted to be political radicals. And then right Hegelians who were a little bit more conservative and uh, wanted to kind of ally Hegel with the, the what, Prussian state at the time. Okay. Um, 
I think so. I mean, I, I'm just kind of going off of what I generally think to be true. And I, I'm not, I think the British idealists probably wouldn't have had those left Hegelian tendencies for sure. And wouldn't have had the like more nationalistic side of the right Hegelians. So it's, it's like a very purely more of a, um, a philosophy and that's not at all sort of involved in the political scene that would have been immediate in the early 19th century for Hegel. Okay. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't specifically know a whole lot about either Mattigart or Bradley or the British idealists in terms of their actual philosophy, but it was idealist is the key. So they're, they're certainly not like what you would think of in terms of Anglo-American philosophy. Uh, if we took like a 20th century Anglo-American philosophy course, you would be doing all work on language and logic and very much from an empiricist tradition, right? Kind of assuming that empiricism is generally true and from a generally realist position. Um, and I think all those things would have been under fire under the British Hegelian, Hegelian's idealists. Okay. Um, all right. So unreality of time. What is McTaggart doing here? Yeah. So McTaggart wants to make an argument here that our notion of time is paradoxical to the point of contradiction and that we actually can't have any consistent logical notion of temporality or of events having a temporal nature in any way. So the paradox basically runs like this. It's a pretty succinct argument when you put together four or five steps, but it can be a little bit difficult to fit it all together at once. So we'll try to go a little bit slow here if we can. Mattaggart thinks that there's generally only two ways you can situate events in temporal relations. One way he calls the A series, another way he calls the B series. So the A series um, is how you order events according to past, present, and future. So for instance, I would say that uh, uh, I went to school yesterday, I went to school uh, today, but I'm talking to Austin now, and I'm going to go to school on Monday of next week. Right, so there's like several events that, that are ordered to have relations to each other in the sense of some are past, some are present, like me talking to you now, and some are future. They're going to happen eventually, right? So those events all have temporal relations. That seems kind of obvious. They're related temporally in the sense of past, present, and future, right? That's the A mm -hmm. series. That's one okay. way of thinking about temporality. Another way of thinking about temporality. And, and then real quick, and in each, in each moment is an event, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know that he really gets specific about the ontology, um, what makes a moment, right? But at some point, there are discrete moments or events. Whatever they are, they can be ordered oh. this way. Okay. He may get into the nitty-gritty on that, but I'm pretty sure you can be agnostic about the ontological part and just still say whatever the discrete units are, they are ordered in some way. Okay, yeah, like right here he says in the article, uh, Unreality of Time, he says... The contents of a position in time are called events. The contents of a single position are admitted to be properly called a plurality of events. And then he says in parentheses, I believe, however, that they can as truly, though not more truly, be called a single event. This view is not universally accepted, and it is not necessary for my argument. And then the next sentence is, a position in time is called a moment. So he's kind of like, yeah, each individual event is a plurality of events, but let's not worry about that. It doesn't matter for the sake of the argument. We'll just call it a moment. Yeah, I think mean, he's just saying you can be agnostic about the ontological stuff and say whatever it is, it's going to have to have some, these events, however big or small they are, have to have some relation to one another. Okay. Can there be a temporal one? So that's the A series, the past, present, and future relations. Um, another way of thinking about it, not necessarily mutually exclusive just another way of thinking about it he calls the b series and the b series is when events are related to one another in terms of earlier and later um so for instance those same events we just talked about right going to school earlier talking to you now going to school again next monday um those events could be past present and future but they could also be um, earlier and later so i can talk about going to school yes uh, today as being earlier than going to school next monday and I can talk about talking to you right now as being later than going to school earlier than earlier today. Mm -hmm. So they're related to each other, but only in this kind of binary, right? They're either earlier or they're later than one another. 
And so that's how okay. they're related. Um, so these are just two different ways of thinking about temporal relations that events can have to one another. And we use both of them all the time, right? We kind of switch between them. So they don't seem to be necessarily mutually exclusive or anything. And so if we assume that Metagor's right, that these are the only two ways, he thinks, really, to think about um, the relations that events have to each other in terms of temporality, right? A series, past, present, and future, or B series, earlier and later. Then he says a contradiction um, arises in one case or an infinite regress arises in the other case, and both of those are bad. And so we end up having to reject the idea that time is real or that temporality is real. Um, so this is how that happens. He says, first of all, um, he thinks that the uh, B series, the earlier and later stuff, isn't genuinely temporal. It can't be sort of the foundational notion of temporality because there's no change that happens in it. And he thinks to have time, you have to have change, right? Time entails change necessarily. So the reason he says that is because if two events are uh, related in terms of one being earlier and one being later, they never ever change. They always stay earlier and later. So for instance, uh, this morning and right now have a relation of earlier and later, right? This morning was earlier than now and now is later than this morning. But in the past, that was also the case about this morning and then this time right now. And in the future, it will always be that way, right? It'll never actually change at any point. Okay. So um, that's why you this view, this B series view becomes later on the B theory of time, which is called eternalism because it's eternal. Nothing actually changes. Everything is always what it is and never actually undergoes any change following from uh, this B, B series idea. And Taggart rejects this as being fundamentally temporal because there's no change. And he thinks you have to have change to have time. So he says, therefore, the B series, this earlier and later than stuff, has to be um, reduced to or founded upon the A series. That has to be the genuinely temporal one where you have past, present, and future. Because there you do have change, right? So an event like going to school today was the future, right, a couple days ago. Mm -hmm. And then it was the present when it was actually happening. And then it became the past as it is now. Mm -hmm. Right. So events actually do change in terms of past, present, and future. They go from future to present to past over time. Okay. And so that he says that does involve change, right? Because any event actually changes its temporal sort of nature from future to present to past in that order. And so that can be the more fundamental notion of change. So we kind of say the B series is derivative and therefore the A series has to be uh, the most genuinely uh, temporal framework. With me so far? I'm with you. Okay. So if the A series is the most fundamental framework of temporality, then he says there's a problem because the A series is actually impossible. And that's the argument. Okay. But here's why it's impossible. <laughs> okay. He says, this is the part that's really like a big old mind fuck, but we'll see if okay. I can explain it. Um, okay. He says, the problem is no event, well, all events are future and then past future and then present and then past right in that order but no you mean event like each each individual event itself is also future uh, uh, past present and future yeah future and then present and then past in that order right? it becomes that successfully because we're moving into the future right so like right now used to be the future now it's the present and it's gonna end up eventually be the past um right. so the problem he says is well, events can't be past, present, and future, right? Because that would be a contradiction. That'd be three things that are exclusive, right? Mutually exclusive. You can't be present, past, and future. And so you would respond to that by saying, what do you think? I'd say, yes, they can. <laughs> in what way? Uh, I mean, I, well, we can get into this in a minute, but I guess I've just been so influenced by Bergson and Deleuze's conception of time. Well, hold, hold on that. Hold on that for a second. Just think okay. about what's the common sense view. If I said, you know, you, you can't think about past, present and future. That's, that's contradictory because you're saying that like this moment right now is past, present and future. And that's a contradiction. You can't be all three. Right. Unless you would say, I mean, I guess it depends on the relation that you're looking at. Cause well, cause this event, like this moment right now is present, but it's, right. it was the future and it's going to be the past right 
So you would just say, well, it's past, present, and future, but not all at the same time. Right? It's successively future and then present and then past, right? This is it, McTaggart's argument. No, this is this is what the opponent would say. Okay, right. right? This is part of his dialectic, so he includes this part. Um, he says, well, an opponent would say, well, yeah, the events aren't simultaneously future, present, and past. Right? If that were the case, that would be a contradiction because you can't be all three of those at the same time. At different times, they are future and then present and then past. Right? They are okay. future and then they become the present and then they become the past in that order and never okay. overlap. Right? right? So then he says, well, then that's the problem because you've just said not at the same time they're future, present, and past, which means okay. you've included now a higher order series of time by which to judge the current past, present, and future. So this higher order series of time, wherein past, present, and future sort of dwell, now has to be an A series or a B series. Well, it can't be a B series because it has to rely upon the A series because you need change. And then that then has to be past, present, and future, which then you would ask, is that past, present, and future all at the same time? And you would respond, no, it's at different times. Well, okay, now there's a third order series oh, and then and the infinite so regress so forth. falls apart. So this is why he says, yeah, this is why he says it falls in infinite regress of just incorporating more and more series of times. And that's vicious in the end, a vicious regress, he thinks, in the end. Okay. Um, yeah, that was the yeah, part of the so argument the big... that I had a tough time following. So, okay. Yeah, so it's weird, right? Because it, it, it doesn't make really any intuitive sense. But if you kind of catch yourself in the middle of the dialectic and say... Well, past, present, and future are not all at the same time. They're at different times. Well, what, what's the ti different time you're referring to? It's not the same A series we've been talking about. It's a different higher order series of events where past, present, and future are related to each other by one becoming the other in succession. Okay. And so if you kind of picture like a higher order, like a, like a little timeline above this timeline right. where past, present, and future are occurring, then you can kind of see where this paradox comes about. So then the point is, if the A series is therefore leading to a infinite, a vicious infinite regress, right? That means it's not a gen, not a, like a genuine temporal framework, right? Cause it doesn't actually tell us about time, about temporal relations. And so that means that the A series is impossible and the B series, which depends upon it are impossible. And since there are no other ways to think about time, but the A and B series, there cannot be time. <laughs> Okay, um, and you have an argument against this, right? Like you have written a, a kind of refuting this or engaging with it? Oh, no way, dude. I, I don't like, give enough of a shit to like think about that much. <laughs> yeah, so here, there here's are There something. are a bunch of arguments against that though, yeah. There are. Is there a standard argument against it? Is it sort of that he's setting up the problem in the wrong way or that he's presuming linear successive notions of time. I mean, the Bergsonian argument would be that he's actually not theory theorizing time, but he's talking about spatiality. Um, because for Bergson, as soon as you start to think about time, you're actually thinking about space. And it's not time. Uh, space is, for Bergson, a qualitative multiplicity that exists beyond our spatial representations of it. So all McTaggart is talking about, according to Bergson, is actually contiguous relations, contiguous spatial relations, not time per se. So that would be like the Bergson argument. Is there like a standard, this is the argument that's like, hey, McTaggart, you're crazy. Yeah, so there, there's three basic arguments against McTaggart. Um, I want to get back to the Bergson after that, though, because I'm not as familiar with that, and I want to hear what, what that argument is, since it's very different than these, I think. The first way to do it is just to kind of reject the idea that time has to involve change. So if, for instance, okay. you believe in like absolute time, right? So there could be time even if there were no things, right? So maybe you like erase all the contingent things from the world and so nothing changes. Would time still occur? If you believe in absolute time, then you don't need any of this. You can just say that uh, like the B series is fine. Well, how does, how, does one, how does one defend absolute time without just positing some sort of formal abstract concept? Like what? What would time be without change? Is that um, a meaningless? Is that a meaningless concept? Because it's not derived from experience, so it's clearly just a formal logical argument. Right. I mean, you could probably make an argument in terms of like a like a theological one, right? 
Like you right. might posit well, but, a God who uh, yeah, where right. time occurs, but then God doesn't change, right? Immutable. So you could okay. say like time occurs. Certainly if God acts in any way, although you have to, how can you act and not change? Then it's change. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So this, yeah, I mean, is, this I, is one of the big contradictions or paradoxes, let's say, that you find in theology with the impassibility of God, that God does right. not change, that God has no passions because God is perfect and immutable. And so God exists in this eternal now is sometimes how it's referred to in pop Christian settings or pop theological settings. Right. And so there are other arguments for absolute time. I'm not familiar with them. I know Mayasu actually argues for absolute time and after finitude, but I totally forgot what his argument was. Um, <laughs> okay. So at some point we would go back to that, but that, that's generally not accepted. Like almost nobody actually argues for that though. Almost everybody okay. thinks time is something that you require change to have. It's a measure of change, people would say. Especially if you're a physicist, you're certainly not going to believe in absolute time. Um, so the other two more popular theories, really quickly, are just yeah. following from the A series and B series, are A theory and B theory of time. Um, and so sometimes that's that involves like semantics and you know stuff that I don't really give a shit about. But uh, the sort of more philosophy of time areas, uh, B theory is sometimes correlated with eternalism, which is the idea that uh, the B theory or the B series, excuse me, actually does um, provide a foundational notion of temporality. And so you don't need the A series at all. And so that's associated with like people who believe in space time worms or four dimensionalism. You know, the idea that, you know, we're, we're extended in space in three dimensions, right? Geometrically. Mm -hmm. But then a four dimensionalist would say, we also have a fourth dimension, which is time. So in the same way, that your finger is part of you, right? Mm -hmm. You right now at this moment is part of your whole temporal self. And your actual self, you as an object, is extended from the moment of your beginning of your existence to the moment of the end of your existence. And so you're like a big old worm spreading across space-time. Okay. And a lot of like people who are into you know, Einsteinian relativity and stuff are big into uh, that thing. Um, so that's one way of getting around it because then you say the B series is actually the more fundamental notion and that doesn't lead to any contradictions. So you're fine there. Um, the other side of the argument is the one that prefers the A series and they call that A theory or sometimes it's, it's kind of correlated with presentism and presentism argues that uh, the to various degrees, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of presentism, I think, but generally they'll say something like the future and the past don't actually exist at all. Mm. So you can't have relations to them. Um, but there's the present that exists. So that has ontological status that the future and the past don't have. Okay. So then you, at that point kind of escape the whole, um, things being future, present and past at the same time idea, but then you could fall back into it in different ways. So I avoid, I find the, the whole presentism, a theory thing, a little bit more confusing or hard to grasp than the, B theory stuff, but that's generally okay. the two options you have. Okay. Now McTaggart himself, he actually offers up a third, third option, right? The C series. Yeah, which literally nobody gives a shit about. Apparently. Well, but see, <laughs> see, yeah, th which is so strange. I I've I've heard that as well. Um, I was talking with a buddy of mine in my department, and he said I hadn't even heard that there was a C series, and I was like, yeah, apparently this is something that like and it's only a, a couple pages later a couple pages later in nature of existence where he actually talks about the c series here here i think is the basic way of understanding it right so hegel makes a distinction between bad infinity and true infinity is mctaggart and let's just say for simplicity's sake bad infinity is the infinity of succession endless succession right you can just keep adding numbers or you can keep expanding uh infinitely within let's not use the word infinite, um, but you can keep doing that everlastingly, right? Like you will not stop. But then true infinity is uh, the absolute for Hegel. It is absolute knowledge or the concept that is fully self-realized or fully self-aware, thought thinking itself fully in the concept or the notion. Um, is So there's a distinction between bad infinity and true infinity. Bad infinity is like endless linear succession, True infinity is the absolute that is beyond that, that is other than that. Is McTaggart just setting up an argument that is basically that? He's arguing against bad infinity in favor of a true infinity. Yeah, he's definitely arguing against bad infinity, right? Because he wants to say that our general notions of time are based upon ba the bad infinity, right? This linear succession that just goes on forever. And um, he wants to say that that leads to a contradiction, so we have to reject it. 
and use like a priori reasoning, right? Just pure like rationalistic thinking to right. reconceptualize what time is. And he wants to do that according to like, yeah, that more Hegelian notion, which it makes sense that no one cares about that, right? Because the British idealism died after Metagart and everyone <laughs> became empiricists. And so they gave like two shits about Hegel, right? And just wanted to talk about time for their own sakes. Mm. Right. It's kind of funny how that happened, actually. <laughs> it is kind of funny how that happened. It's almost like they were like, okay, well, fuck this. We can't do anything with this. So we're going to start like looking at things now. <laughs> yeah, it'd be like if you wrote a song, like a really like long, like 17 minute prog rock song, and you put like your whole life into like, composing it and producing it. And then someone just like took a riff and that riff became ultra famous, but by itself. And so no one knew like anything about the rest of the song or the lyrics or anything. It was just like one riff. <laughs> right that would suck yeah that's funny i okay, guess so it's kind of my... how maybe like like Jimi hendrix feels sometimes where he's just known for the dear 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 yeah exactly dear, 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 dear. <laughs> that's all he's known for purple haze they don't even know the rest of the song they don't even know that there's lyrics to it probably <laughs> <laughs> um so here's my question i feel like this argument might be problematic at one level because it's just purely formal. So it seems like he's making a formal argument or a formal truth or a logical truth that is – so it's like sure, formally there are relations between temporal orders and they're the same. But that's not space-time. That's not space-time complexes. That's that, that's a completely different argument. So what he's arguing is that at a formal level, time seems unreal or there is a paradox of time at the formal level. But why why should we assume that at the ontological level or at the empirical level per se? So I don't under, like do, is there a category error to say that formally speaking there are these paradoxes time is unreal in the formal sense not that it doesn't exist because I think we should probably make a distinction but that it's unreal or irreal maybe but that at like maybe an empirical level we're talking about completely different things is that not a, is he not making a category error? I mean I think what he's saying is that the way we experience time has this sort of common sense appeal to it. Um, or at least we, we make ontological extrapolations from our common sense experience, which seem to have appeal in, in the terms of our in, in, like intuition, right? And he says, well, what happens when we try to formalize that in terms of relations, right? Talking about the relations between, uh, temporal relations between events. Can we formalize that? And he says, no, we can't formalize that. It just leads to a contradiction or an infinite regress bad vicious infinite regress and so that means that it can't be the case so he's not really saying time is unreal so much as he's saying temporality is unreal or the idea that you can formalize time based upon our common sense intuitions about it could that's we say what he's saying is unreal in hegelian terms that abstract time is unreal in what sense so uh instead of concrete time for Hegel. So it's the abstraction. It's the sort of form emptied of its content that you can't formalize time as an abstraction. But we could potentially, and this would lead him to the C series, we could think of time in another way, which is in terms of the true infinity or the absolute or the Hegelian concept, which I don't understand his argument. So I don't know how he would get there. But I mean, is that kind of what he's saying? So we can't abstract from everyday experience to a formal notion of time. Yeah, I mean, so that's, kind of, yeah. that's kind of the idealist like methodology, right? I mean, Hegel begins like phenomenology of spirit with talking about sense certainty, right? Now we get these common sense notions of what things are based upon what our senses tell us. And we kind of you know, use extrapolate from there and make ontological uh, commitments about the way things are based upon our common sense intuition. And then that's just wrong. Like it leads to contradictions and paradoxes. So it's just wrong. So that means we have to like rely upon reason to try and figure out what actually the world is like, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like a dialectic that flows from realizing that our common sense notions have to be negated mm -hmm. into something and become something else. And so that's the common like idealist picture is to do that, right? And I think, okay. yeah, it's exactly what Mittagger's doing. He's saying, here's what our common sense notion of time is. And we think this makes a lot of sense, but then you expose it to some, some logic here and you realize it doesn't make sense. And so you got to negate it and then follow the dialectic into something else. Mm. And nobody just follows his argument into the dialectic <laughs> to that other thing. Well, they do, right? Well, they produce their own dialectic, right? Which is, okay, mm. so you're saying we have to reconceptualize 
what the B series or the A series is in some way. And they just follow one of those two paths rather than doing like the high minded idealist thing, like bi- big dialectical thinking. They do small dialectical thinking. <laughs> okay. Well, what do you think about the Hegelian like resolution? Do you think that there's merit to it? Uh, Metagards? Yeah. I really have no idea what to think about Metagards because you kind of have to buy into like a whole lot of stuff to follow him on the whole reconceptualizing time in an idealist format. That that involves, I think, like it's like accepting the the argument for the unreal the unreality of temporality, and then making the jump to like full idealist is like a like you go to like Guitar Center and you want to buy like a cable. And then you're forced into like buying like an amp and three cabs and a drum set. Right. Okay. And you're like, dude, right. I, dude, I'm not a band. Like <laughs> I only know how to play guitar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want me to buy a mixing board, motherfucker? I'm not a producer. <laughs> um, so it seems to me that he's engaging in a really historic set of philosophical arguments that we can trace back maybe even to Zeno. What do you think about that? Like, I'm reading this and I'm thinking, oh, this is very similar to Zeno's paradox of the arrow, right? So it's a paradox of motion. Is that kind of what McTaggart is? Because he doesn't say this. I'm so used to people, like, when they engage, they just reference the shit out of other people. But in this really tight 15-page article, he doesn't reference anybody. He just develops an (laughs) argument. So how does he situate himself? Is he kind of engaging with this ancient philosophical paradoxical set of problems that you get like with Zeno's paradoxes and motion. I mean, as an analogy, I think you're absolutely right that it's doing a similar thing to Zeno, right? Cause Zeno's saying that our common sense notion of, of space uh, using mathematics to measure it seems like great. It seems to fit perfectly, but actually if you inspect it for two minutes, you realize at least the paradoxes. Um, and so therefore he says motion can't happen, <laughs> right? Or yeah. motion is unreal. Yeah, motion so yeah, it, is unreal for Zeno. Yeah, it's just mathematics is, is more sure than motion. Um, so yeah, it's but just, and then it's a, but but then time is a measure of motion for the ancients. So that relates to it, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think analogously it does. Okay. Um, where were you going to go more with that? No, yeah, I'm just curious as to. Uh, so I'm just wondering if McTaggart's kind of making the inverse argument. So if. If time is a measure of motion, McTaggart kind of presumes that. So his argument is really just built on the presumption of the problems of motion and spatiality in Zeno, but he's talking about it with reference to time as being the measure of that paradox of motion. Well, it's not just motion, though, right? Because motion is a kind of change, but it's not the entirety of change. Okay. You can have change in properties without having change in actual space by motion. Can you? Right. Yeah, you can change in properties without changing in, in motion, especially if it's an abstract property. Okay. Um, see, see Bergson, I mean? Bergson would argue that as soon as you represent anything, even an abstract property, you're spatializing it. So. Okay, so this is a good segue. I want to hear what Bergson's argument is, and you got to like not use full Bergsonese. I know. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Okay. If you can. So, yes. But here's the thing. It's fucking hard. Okay. <laughs> So, so bear with me. Where is this from? Where did he address this? Time and Free Will. Okay. Which was a book, and then he wrote another one called Matter and Memory. And he, which is a even more difficult book. But so in Time and Free Will, the argument is this in simple steps. So we think of time as being linear and successive, like moment after moment after moment after moment. Bergson says, As soon as you think about time in that way, you actually are just thinking about space and it's not really time because the moments are in a differential relation to one another uh, of contiguity, not temporality. So they're spatially related to each other. Think of a timeline. As soon as you think of a timeline, one dash to the next dash to the next dash is a spatial relationship. He says, think of mathematics. And this is the basis for Bergson's understanding of mathematics as well, arithmetic in particular, right? So as soon as you think of numbers, think of the number nine and then the number four. Well, really, the number nine and the number four are just abstractions of 
individual one plus one plus one plus one plus one nine times, that's what the number nine is, and same with the number four, which are all abstractions of spatial relations. And that even nine itself is then an abstract spatial totality. So anytime you think about anything, you're representing things, you're cognizing something. As soon as you're doing that, you're spatializing it. So the way that McTaggart then thinks about time for Bergson's argument, obviously Bergson preceded McTaggart, so he's not making this argument against McTaggart, but this would be a Bergsonian retort. Anytime McTaggart is talking about time, he's actually not talking about time. He's only talking about spatial relations and the differential spatial relations and the formal differential spatial relations. So what is time then for Bergson? Well, hold on really because, quick. Let me just, let me just yeah. get something on that because I'm trying to understand it. Okay. Um, that just seems to me like he's flipping it on its head by saying, mm-hmm. you know, the, the common notion is that you have abstractions and you concretize them. And he's kind of saying, no, things are concrete first. And then you, you sort of, you know, abstract them. You make them abstract. Um, I mean, just what's the argument for that? Because I could just as willingly say, no, <laughs> actually, and you're taking an abstract thing and you're concretizing it. Or, you know, when I'm drawing a timeline, I'm making an analogy between space and time. But that doesn't mean that I'm turning time into space. Well, then I how could, do you... I could just as you... easily say, instead of a timeline, I could do this. Here's how we measure time. Bam. And bam. There. <laughs> There's examples of earlier and later. But that's weird, right? Because we no, no, know no, space but, okay. a lot better than time. So, so Husserl would make a similar argument, I think, here. You say bam, and then bam. You only are relating the previous BAM to the present BAM in terms of your memory as it's been represented in a spatial contiguous relation. And so you think you're thinking about time as being some sort of true temporal relation, but all you've done is spatialize two instances, and you've done that through uh, your representation of it in memory. Okay, I get that it has to involve memory. Like That goes back to Descartes, right? That you have to rely upon memory. Um, for anything in the past. There isn't an actual existing past that's there for you to like, call upon. But right. how is that spatializing it? Because it's a relation of contiguity. So I think that that... Yeah, I, that's the thing that I don't understand because we think of space as being um, like a like a physical thing, right? Maybe? It's not, though. <laughs> Probably. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. <laughs> Um, well, and then especially for Kant, it's not. Kant, it's a sort of... Form of intuition. Formal. Yeah, it's a formal, it's an aesthetic formal. But even if you don't think that, I mean, I don't think barely any philosophers say space is a thing. Well, so then what would space be? I don't know, but it's not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's not a you, thing. I mean, you could say it's just an abstract measure of things. It's not itself a thing. Okay, so it's an abstract measure of things. So maybe Bergson would say it's an abstract measure of contiguous relations. But, I mean, temporality is contiguous too, right? No, it's... The temporal it's, moments touch each other. As soon as you think that, you're thinking in terms of abstract spatiality. Wait, I'm, I'm using an analogy. They don't literally touch each other the way... But, you know, space doesn't touch each other either because it's not a thing. So, like, it doesn't apply to either of those. What do you, but what do you mean it doesn't touch, it doesn't touch anything? Well, because touch is, touch is a metaphor, right? I'm not literally saying that the two things physically touch because it's not physical. Time's not physical. It can't touch anything. But right. the moments are in succession. Right. As soon as you and think... succession's a temporal term. Tem- no, succession's a temporal term. It's not a physical term, not a spatial term. <laughs> not for Bergson, it's not. <laughs> oh, fuck me. <laughs> yeah, succession for Bergson is... It's one after the other. That's what it is. It's a spatial relation. One oh, after the other in memory is a spatial differential relation. Okay, at because a certain point, it's like it... initial conditions issue, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I mean, it's a sort of deductive argument, right? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. and so, so then the question is, what is time for Bergson? Duration, right? Time is duration, which and means what? It is. He he uses all these different words for it, but he a qualitative multiplicity. It is, and he uses a via negativa to get there. So time is not space. Time is not unity. Time is not stasis. Time is not uh, successive. Uh, and then he sort of, and I know you hate this shit. I know you hate via negativa. <laughs> but he goes through this process, and it's time is not these things. So what is it? 
and then he would do like it's it's not uh it's not quantitative any quantitative measure is spatial so it's not quantitative it's qualitative it's not it's not a unity it's a multiplicity and so when he calls it a qualitative multiplicity i sort of get the feeling that we could liken it to like Badiou's notion of multiplicity obviously Deleuze's notion of difference as being pure difference it's this realm of unbounded indeterminate chaotic expressive flow and this all pertains to his notion of elan vital right like the vitalism which is the vital force that carries things forward well what is it that is the vital force that carries life forward that flows life it's time it is this endless pushing forward uh that is constantly disrupting all of our spatial representations so every time you make a relation of succession, which he would call a spatial or a contiguous spatial relation, every time you do that, it's being disrupted in the next moment by a new temporal succession, right? But it's not a new temporal succession. That's just our way of cognizing the experience of qualitative multiplicity or duration or temporality. So it's disruption that we're constantly then kind of like bringing back from disruption into some sort of ordered spatial representation. Okay, I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. So this term qualitative multiplicity... Is yep. the multiplicity itself qualitative, or is every thing in the multiplicity qualitatively related to every other thing in the multiplicity? Oh, I don't know. That's a very good question. Uh, my my inclination would be to say that yeah, it's it's both, and the reason is because Deleuze then would probably expand on this and talk about fractals and some sort of like fractal ontology. So it's multiplicities within multiplicities within multiplicities, all the way down, right? Exactly, endlessly. Yeah, so I mean, I think you can accept that and still follow something along with Taggart's line or any, any of the analytic stuff following Taggart because he's, he's agnostic about that stuff, right? He's agnostic about the ontological nature of uh, events. But I guess the issue comes with uh, this idea of time then um, being duration. And so it's like, I I keep getting this picture in my head of like a like a mysterianism like it's just like a it's just the underbelly of all of existence and it's primitive and we can't say anything about it really that's why we have to be all vacant be a negative about it yeah it's it's I mean it's, it's like in the Prozorov sense it's the nothing or it's the void or it's the generic or the invariant something along those lines which I'm actually fine with the idea of time being primitive a primitive concept. Um, and you don't have to explain it via anything else. Like if anything's going to be primitive, I feel like time is a good candidate for that, mm. right? Because um, you can't really reject it. Like even if you reject certain notions of it, you have to come up with new ones since it's such an obvious factor of experience and of the way the world works. But yeah, I mean, I guess even if you want to say events are, are different than like our common sense notion or... um there's multiplicity all the way down in terms of events or they're not related as discrete units or whatever else. I still get the sense that you're going to have to say, even if like time is one big thing, it's just one. It's not a unity though. It's a multiplicity. So you can't say that. Right. Um, it's a field. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a field. It's a, it's a potency. It's a force, but not in, not in the scientific sense. It's a creative – because his other book that he wrote is called Creative Evolution, which he argues sort of against Darwinian evolution, which he says is nonsensical. And it's because Darwin doesn't have an understanding of what is the active motor that drives evolution. For him, it's you know random mutation. And for Bergson, that's ludicrous. It's vitality that is actually – it's the elan vital. It's time. It's this – it's not directional. It's not teleological, but it still is – I'm using this metaphorically here, but it's like agential in a way. It is the agent of history. Yeah, this is where I get off the bus, I think. At a certain point, <laughs> you just uh, – yeah. philosophers decide to say things that are beyond the bounds of philosophy, and they get into like scientific concepts and mystical stuff, and I'm just like, okay, man. <laughs> that's where you are cool. Like keep going produce that shit but i don't know yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, concrete enough for me to grasp. See, he does. He does try to use later on. He does try to use an appeal to intuition to articulate his understanding of time as well. And I don't fully understand it because he says something along the lines of there's a difference between what he calls imagined intuition and an intuition of time. And imagined intuition is kind of what we were talking about before is the tendency to spatialize, right? So, uh, but he says we do intuit time in our daily experience. So this would be the sort of phenomenological or maybe McTaggart would like this as well, right? You do intuit time when we're intuiting novelty in creation, but Change, this right? exactly, yeah. But this entails that we're able to tell without describing the difference between an intuition of the time that actually exists, like the kind that possesses novelty and creation or change, and then what he calls an imagined intuition, which is the kind of time that does not exist because it does not possess novelty and creation. And I think in that sense, there's kind of almost a similarity to an A series and B series there. But um, the imagined intuition is what takes place in memory. And that's where this gets really difficult for me because the book Matter and Memory is very counterintuitive. And for him, for example, when you enter into a room or when I see you, Troy, the reason that I recognize your face, it's not because I'm making associations based on bits of information that I'm receiving through sense experience, but rather your face conforms with the memory that I have of you. So it's a sort of protension based on a previous retention rather than an association of information that I'm receiving, like bits of information that I'm receiving. And I don't fully understand the argument. It's fucking hard as shit. But all of this relates together. It's based on his understanding of memory and this storehouse of memory that is like this cone of memory that constantly exists behind us. Like imagine it's behind you, this cone, this infinite cone of memories that you kind of store. That's your retention. And so every time I'm encountering a new experience, it's not just simply receiving bits of information and I'm making associations and therefore I recognize Troy, but I'm taking bits of information from my cone and I'm kind of... Uh, imposing them, let's say, onto the world in front of me. And that's how I engage with anything in the present, which is then how you can understand why he would think of succession and the way we generally think of temporality as being spatiality, because it exists all in that, uh, that, that cone of retention or that cone of memory. Does that yeah, so clear like, anything up? Uh, a little bit. Um, at, the, at the macro level or like the, the step back a minute and look at it level, this this makes me think of the one like one of the um, advantages that analytic philosophy has over continental philosophy, which is that you can you can read a, a twelve or fifteen page paper and like get an issue and agree with it or disagree with it. And right. about continental philosophy, sometimes you have to like buy the whole kit and caboodle because <laughs> any individual argument is going to be involved in a much longer series of things that's about the nature of all of existence. Um. Evolution and, and yeah, Darwinian like, theory, and <laughs> you got to buy the whole damn thing. Like Mataggart, that was yeah. his thing, right? He wanted it to buy the whole damn thing of right. his 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 idealism, and then the analytic guys are just like, "Yeah, we'll just take this one chapter." Right. But yeah. It's not necessarily for, like it's not like a an absolute advantage because it has downsides to it, but it's it's one advantage. Yeah, like you were just talking before we started recording about the essay by Frega that you said is ten pages. Fucking read it. It's fantastic, and it's it's self-contained. You don't need to then go yeah. in and read. Whereas if you want to understand Bergson, and this is why in continental philosophy, people obviously – or people oftentimes, they identify themselves with thinkers rather than maybe a particular discipline. And it's or because – the, the, Exactly, because the thinker develops a set of positions over a lifetime. So – you know, you can spend your entire life as a continental philosopher being a Bergsonian and grappling with these three texts of his that are just fucking insane, but that all infuse one another and, and converse with one another. And that, yeah, you could be an expert on time and free will, but then you're going to go to a conference and someone's going to be like, ah, yes, but he expands on this in matter and memory and he clarifies it here and blah, 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 blah. And so there's much more of a, like a syncretic orientation a syncretistic, I mean, orientation in continental philosophy. Yeah, exactly. So like you, you could be a Deleuzian or you could be a Bajuian, right? Or a Zizekian. But in analytic philosophy, there are no like Putmanites or 
there are some crypt there are some Kripkians, but they're kind of creepy. So <laughs> that's like the one time the cult of personality actually existed. A um, Luesian. But it also like interestingly fits, right? Because the analytic, you know, the, the English guys are like boring as shit. Like they're kind of like they're assholes and they're smug and they're not interesting. And all the like French dudes are like, you know, just macking on chicks in cafes and they're like so <laughs> badass. So like it makes sense that the cult of personality stuff really exists there in the works as well as with the yeah. persons. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's a nice little, it's a nice little like correlation that, that I appreciate in terms of being someone who likes organization and, you know, consistency. Mm. And I am starting to realize that I want to read a little more analytic philosophy. So, because I am not, uh, the organizational type. And so for me, I'm kind of like, oh, maybe I can introduce a little bit of that into my thinking. So <laughs> you want to get a little neurotic? Yeah, a little bit. Or, I mean, I guess I don't see it as as neurotic so much as, uh, well, I guess it would lead that lead to that. In my mind, it doesn't lead to neurosis. It leads to stability. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it all depends, right? For someone, someone's a little bit more chaotic than uh, at least disability as opposed to, you know, OCD. Yeah, maybe, maybe. So, okay. So is there anything else you want to say in wrapping up? Like, what are your thoughts on McTaggart's? whole thing I mean, what do you think about time it's weird man this is one issue that i just it's so weird that usually when a philosophical issue comes up and it's kind of confounding it makes me really interested to kind of dive into more and figure out what i think about it or at least some bit of what i think about it and this issue is really interesting and i have no desire to actually figure out like what i think about it for mm. some reason like it's the one issue where it's just fun and i like it and it was fun to do the it's really fun to do this conversation on it but i don't i feel like i have any dog in the race you know like right nothing's at stake it feels like to me here uh, how do you feel about it yeah so because i'm doing a lot of work on financial speculation it's all based on presumptions of time and i'm really curious to see so it's it's part of the reason that, like you mentioned this topic like a couple months ago and I wrote it down on like a list of potential future episodes because I was like, oh, you know, I, I'm curious. I've always wondered actually about McTaggart's paradox of time because you hear about, oh, A series, B series, but in continental circles, at least they don't really engage with it too often, right? Um, but I've been doing a lot of work, like I said, on speculation and financial derivatives markets and things like that, which all presume a certain conception of time with speculation being some sort of bet on the future or a gamble on the future. And so I'm really curious about thinking through our understandings of temporality. And I actually think, and here's where I think there's something quite political in it. I actually think so that if you look at, at an area that could be problematic with our common sense conceptions of time, that if time is, if we can conceive of time the way Bergson does, then that means that certain Marxian understandings of historical development are problematized. That means that the way that we think of speculation as being a gamble on the future is transformed because then speculation actually becomes, rather than a gamble on the future, it's actually an enclosure of the past, right? If everything is just the past and everything is just flowing into the past and the future only exists insofar as it's the guarantee of future qualitative multiplicities perpetually expanding, then you're not actually quantifying or making a gamble on the future per se, but you're actually quantifying some elements that have already been stored in the past and you're bringing them into the present or into the future and then you're speculating on them. So it kind of changes the way that we think about speculation. So for me, I'm working through some of these issues right now and I think that there might be something fruitful to consider if we don't think of time in terms of linear succession or... Um, in the ways that are presumed maybe by McTaggart's theory of time. That's interesting. So like the, the future speculation stuff, because it involves like the pretension, pretension, retention yeah. um, thing you were talking about earlier, that's the sense in which it's bringing the past through memory into the present. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. That's yeah. interesting, then, but I need, yeah. I need you to make a promise to me. Okay. We're never going to read Bergson for a book club or anything. <laughs> yeah. Deal. You would never deal, do deal, that deal. to me. Okay, good. Yeah, I think you would like time and free will. Like no, you said, I, you... I've yeah, I've read a little bit of secondary literature from Bergson, and it was interesting. But there's a there's a great book. It's got a 
red and white cover, actually. I think it's called Key Writings, for anyone who's interested. And it's on Henri Bergson, Key Writings. You can delve into some of that shit. You can just read some of his essays, just to whet the appetite, and then you'll spend the next 50 years of your life beating your head <laughs> against the wall. <laughs> All right, sweet. So now we're going to move on to the final segment of the episode, The Sticky Leaves. This is the segment where one of us gets to share what it is that is giving us meaning in a world that is devoid of meaning. And so if Troy thinks that time is interesting but doesn't give a fuck about exploring it further, what does give him (laughs) meaning? What does he want to explore further? So my Sticky Leaves this week is something I saw on the internet, which is usually the case, that was really just unequivocally great. Okay. I had no, no bad sides to it. It was just beautiful. And that was, have, did you watch the, um, the video of the, uh, of the black guy in uh, Indianapolis who uh, took a video of all the Latino uh, contractors who uh, yes. went out on a wildcat strike? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so here's, here's the context. Um, this guy's name is Antoine Dangerfield, and he was working at a uh, construction site where they were putting together a UPS hub, I think is what it was. And there were several different contractors there. He was part of one, and one of the other contractors that he was not part of had the situation where some uh, Latino workers, uh, majority Latino workforce, were uh, they didn't like this one guy who was a safety instructor, and apparently he was really racist and was trying to get them in trouble a lot of times. And at one point, uh, the guy got mad at a couple of them and sent them home. Um, and so the rest of the Latinos in solidarity just decided to leave. It's a wildcat strike, right? It's impromptu without any union representation. Um, mm-hmm. And they just all just left. And this guy, Antoine Dangerfield, just took out his phone and recorded them walking out and gave about a minute and a half or so of just beautiful extemporaneous dialogue, which we're going to play right now. Amigos, get about this motherfucker. Y'all got him fucked up. Look at him. They sent a couple of them home. They all packed they shit up and shut this motherfucker down. Nigga, who y'all think y'all playing with? Mexico, man, this is what black people need to be on, man. I swear to God, I love this shit. They are packing they shit up and shutting this motherfucker. Huh? Uh, on my mama. All that shit. <laughs> they are not bullshitting. They packed up. Yeah, I see. It's over. Them mothers now packed up and dipped. They thought they was going to play with these amigos. And they said, oh, yeah, we rise together, homie. And they leaving. And they not bullshitting. Take this in, man. Look at this, man. They shut this big motherfucker down today, man. We all going home, man. The SAs. Look, ain't no grinding, cutting, welding. This is motherfucker dead ass quiet. The Mexicans shut this motherfucker down, nigga. Said, fuck you, bitch. And really, and really, see, this is what I'm talking about, baby. I swear to God, they got me here geeked up on my Malcolm back shit. Oh, my mama, nigga. Fuck the bullshit, nigga. Look at this. They shut this bitch down. They pissed them off, nigga. And they said, fuck you, we out. We not working no more today. Kiss my ass, nigga. I'll let y'all tomorrow on my mama. That's great. Look. Ain't nobody here. We're just cleaning up. We're going home. It's all from right with the essays, nigga. Fuck it. Go to the crib. Go to the go to the casa. Hasta la luego, me and muy bien. You swear to God, these motherfuckers want to play it. Hey. Okay, so now that you've heard that, my favorite part is this line. When he goes, ain't no grinding, cutting, welding. This motherfucker dead ass quiet. The Mexicans shut this motherfucker down. <laughs> That's my favorite part. Yeah, I just love I just, how enthusiastic he is so at seeing this thing. How, how it's just, just completely... It was something he could not have possibly predicted could ever happen. His, yeah, exactly. And there's a, a joy. There's a, an excitement in this. It's, he's so... It's almost like he's proud, but he's also astonished. And... He's like, the audacity. <laughs> like, oh my God, the balls that these Mexican dudes have. He's like, they thought that they would be able to, like, fuck up one or two of them or whatever it was. But he's like, they didn't understand that these Mexican guys don't give a fuck. And they're out. <laughs> and he keeps saying that over and over again. He's like, they just don't give a fuck. He's like, they're, he's like, they don't understand. Like, it's almost like, oh my God, he's so, 
overcome with surprise um, at their audacity. I love it. Yeah. You, know, you know what it reminds me of? Uh, mm. The reactions of fans and even other players when someone dunks on somebody else in a basketball game. <laughs> It's like yeah. the exact same reaction, right? It's like yeah, the audacity. How dare you? <laughs> yeah, it's like it's it's, it's audacity, right? Because you just dunked on a guy and like put your balls in under his chin or something. But then also yeah. it's like an amazing feat. So you're like impressed. Yes. And then you just get full of rapture and you have to like run around and kind of scream a little bit and gesticulate wildly. Yeah. Yeah, it's like that same thing, except the difference here is when someone dunks on somebody is usually a powerful person dunking on a less powerful person. Right, or a right. better athlete dunking on a lesser athlete. But his part of his rapture is the they dared to tr to try and do this, not realizing these guys will just just fuck them up. Like they'll just they'll just leave. Mm. Right? Like they don't have to take this shit. Like they they didn't understand what was really at stake. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now I don't know, do you know the fallout that happened from the video? Yeah, so he got fired. Apparently, yeah. from by his contractor. This was great too. I mean, it's it's terrible that he got fired, obviously, right? And he shouldn't have gotten fired, and you shouldn't ever get fired for something like that. But his response to getting fired was just whatever, man. It was awesome. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, didn't he say like it was totally worth it? And <laughs> yeah, he exactly. He said it was totally worth it. It was totally because it got like four million whatever views or something. And, like uh, yeah, we should not like celebrate um, people responding well to being victimized by the system, right? Like. There's one part of that where I don't want to encourage that. But it's also kind of awesome that he's just like, this was so worth it. It was so awesome. It's like seeing a dunk and like just rushing on the court and then getting tackled by security guards, mm. you know, and being like banned from the arena for the rest of your life. But it's like, whatever, dude, that was so like awesome. I don't give a shit. <laughs> Well, see, here's the thing that I think is interesting because people aren't celebrating the victimization. They're celebrating the attempt at victimization that then turned into an act of solidarity. So it was an act of imposition of power that then got overturned by people power. And I think that's what that's what he's responding to. And I think that's why it kind of caught fire so much, at least on left Twitter, right? Where everyone's like, yeah, oh, yeah for sure. <laughs> Wait, I was talking about the victimization of him getting fired specifically. Oh, that bit. Okay, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, I think you're totally right that it was it was definitely one of those rare moments where you actually get some joy. Like you see that those glimpses of why it matters for people to be in solidarity. Like it produces immense joy and rapture. Mm. Right? When you all work together towards a common goal full of, you know, empathy for one another and care. Like to be motivated by those factors to then risk a little bit of yourself for other people. Like that's it's beautiful in one sense. And also produces like great joy, like that. That's at the heart of this. Stuff. I, I, it's, it's really easy to forget that. I think in the old days they would have called that the Holy Spirit or some sort of mystic power or the Elon Vital or something like that, right? I mean, that's what it yeah, is. Yeah, it was like it's, some Acts two Pentecost shit right there. That's it, man. Yeah. No, I, I, I did. I saw that video. I enjoyed it. I would imagine the guy. What's his name again? Antoine Dangerfield. What a great name, too, right? I would imagine that Antoine would have gotten picked up quite easily, right? That someone would have said he should not have gotten fired from that. That's an injustice. Hey, Antoine, we're going to give you a job. Yeah, I mean, he did have a GoFundMe, which um, you should go search GoFundMe Antoine Dangerfield if you want to help the guy out. I'm pretty sure he's going to get taken care of by brothers and sisters. Yeah. And uh, maybe he can get a little payment for doing interviews and shit like that and sharing the story. So, but again, I just imagine because... You know, there's enough fucking work out there, and it's not like he was being lazy or something like that, or he was violating any on-site job rules. So I would imagine that someone will watch that and be like, well, you got fired unjustly, so come over here, motherfucker. I'll hire you, you know? Yeah, I hope so. Sweet. Well, fun episode, man. We Quite philosophical, but I enjoyed that. Yeah, that was really good. Yeah. Look at so, you enjoying a little bit of analytic philosophy. Who would have guessed? Here's the thing. I, I I feel like whenever I read it, I enjoy it. You know, it's it's not the same, obviously, but it's like when I read Heidegger. I don't think I'm gonna enjoy it, but then I enjoy it more than I think I would enjoy it. It's like Kant. I don't think I'm gonna enjoy <laughs> Kant, but I really enjoy reading Kant too, you know? I've never understood people who don't enjoy Kant. Like I guess the prose isn't great. Like I get that, but I mean, not everybody's like like human Nietzsche, you know? They're not all great writers, but if it's interesting, like, that's fun. Yeah. Well, I see, I actually think that Kant is really easy to follow. That's one of the reasons I like him. 
you know? Like, Heidegger's more poetic and stuff like that, and he has obviously some serious political clouds hanging over him. But his ideas I find quite fascinating, or at least what he's wrestling through, or at least the way he's framing it I find interesting. Kant, I find him to be very systematic, which is something that you don't find in, like, reading Deleuze or Nietzsche, who are much more meandering and aphoristic. And so when I go and I read the analytic philosophy, it's it's a nice breath of fresh air because it's, here's what I'm going, and this is how they write their articles, here's what I'm going to say, here's the argument that I'm arguing against, and uh, and this is how I'm going to make my argument against that argument. And then they're like, okay, cool. And then they do it in like 10 pages. And then at the end, you're like, okay. <laughs> and then they say, here's what I said. It's like the typical, here's how you write a high school essay, right? <laughs> you tell someone in your thesis paragraph, this is what I'm going to say. Then you say it. And then you just tell them what you just said. And that's how analytic philosophers write. And it is very, I don't know, it, it's it's much more accessible in certain ways. Although I actually did have a really difficult time with um, – the final part of McTaggart's argument. I was like, what the fuck? So I appreciated yeah, the I mean, clarification. Technically, he's not an analytic philosopher, though. Just everybody else after him that responded to it. Ah, uh, I guess. I guess. Um, well, cool. So uh, y'all can hit us up on Twitter uh, at owls underscore at underscore Don. You can email us, owls at donpodcast at gmail.com if you have any questions or anything like that. Our Patreon account is up and live. We have, I think, like 20 or 21 patrons now which means we're super close Getting to opening close it up 25 that's right uh at 25 we'll open it up so that y'all can recommend subjects for us to address on future episodes um a bonus episode is going to be coming out in the next couple of days so be prepared for that for the patrons who are already out there what's that going to be on uh it's going to be on just some musings on uh like the protestant work ethic and on the idea of what work could mean beyond the typical understanding of wage labor that we seem to presume in a, a capitalist environment, but kind of just thinking about a, a post-work work world. Think about job guarantees and shit like that. So, okay. Would you like to join me if you have time? Uh, maybe. We'll see. Okay. Okay. We'll I mean, I'd like to out. join you, but we'll see if I have time. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> Troy is swamped right now. Send him messages of love on Twitter. He's busy as fuck right now. So yeah, so if you want to have access to the Patreon bonus episodes, go ahead and go over to patreon.com slash owls at dawn and find out about how to get that. Uh, iTunes, if you could leave us a five-star rating and review, that would really be beneficial. Am I forgetting anything, Troy? Just one thing, dude. Oh, what up? Dasta Dani Americanski. Mm-hmm.